Welcome to Open Tables. With your hosts, Cynthia Sue Larson. But it's okay to for everybody to change. It's okay to let things go. And that's really powerful. Christopher Anatra. The universe is based on commerce. You know me as the quantum businessman. Jerry Hicks. I feel like I've woken up in a parallel dimension where everybody's exactly the same. They look the same, same memories, generally speaking, but they're different. (gasps) And Shane Robinson. Nobody has all the answers, so everybody's welcome to share their ideas, and it really expands our consciousness when we do that. Open Table. Unique perspectives for a new view of reality. And welcome to today's show. This is Cynthia Sue Larson, officially welcoming you to our wonderful program today. And we'll be talking with um, Rory Duff, as you can see. He is a geobiologist, and we're fortunate to have him with us. We've also, right now, got with me in the studio, back in the green room, Shane Robinson from Unbiased and on the Fence. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And we're going to bring in Rory Duff, too. He's here right now. Thank you so much. But before we get started, we're going to just read through the disclaimers. Uh, This is our standard disclaimer that we do every month. The content you are about to watch is meant for thought and consideration. Please be respectful of each other and opinions shared. This is a safe space to express thoughts, ideas, and information. Please note that no copyright infringement is intended with regard to inclusion of short excerpts of material that are included in accordance with fair use under Section 107 of the Copyright Act. Yeah, next slide. So our agenda for today is mostly focused um, on our guest, of course, but we will talk with our about our sponsors, as we always do, um, providing information about new plants and animals that have come up in the last month that we are aware of and that people have brought to our attention. Um, We'll then go through some updates from Shane and myself. We've got a video update from Christopher Anatra. And uh, next, we'll go through Mandela Effects and talk about the Golden Mandy survey that we're running. And next, we'll go through the Changing Energetic Times with Rory Duff. That's the meat of today's message and the the whole heartbeat of the show. It's the main program. Uh, Part of that, we'll be going through some Mandela Effects, like a little quiz with Rory that you can join in on and do too. You know, these are fun. No wrong answers here. Just whatever you remember. And then we'll have live question and answer. So this is your chance. If you're in the live stream right now, go ahead and put questions. If you want to make sure that we see it later, sometimes we bring them the questions up later when it's appropriate. If we didn't get to the questions earlier, um, then be sure to remember what they are and type them in. And of course, we love and welcome any of the super chat that you'd like to do. That helps to support everything that we're doing. We are a nonprofit. And our next slide, let's go ahead and start taking a look at sponsor number one. I heard about this um, Lazarus species, which is an animal that has basically apparently come back from the dead uh, from one of our alert viewers who brought it to my attention. And this Lazarus species, I I don't know if I can pronounce this, um, it's the Knisna elephant. And these are no longer extinct as had been thought to be the case. They're apparently currently thriving. They are living in forests, coming out at night and grazing. And this was found to be true by scientists who were looking at the elephant scat, the droppings, and discerning this um, based on basically looking at the sort of excrement, they are able to determine what the diet is and what the species is of these creatures. Now they're rather large piles of excrement, as you can imagine. So it's it's not like there's a prankster out there. Um, obviously, this is really the, the case that 
Um, these elephants have returned. They, some, this one has been photographed from a great distance. And there's a whole website that you can go to check it out if you'd like to. Any, and we've got Shane here and Rory. So any comments anybody would like to make about, about these elephants? This is actually new to me. Um, I, I, I didn't know about, uh, I, I'm not really an elephant guy or whatever. So I, I'm not really familiar about the different breeds or whatever. But I think it's interesting that they just come out at night and they can't really spot them that often. That's kind of strange. But. I can I can help with the, the spelling and the pronunciation. It's, it's Nisna. And it's actually from uh, the southern part of South Africa. It's just in, in the nice South area. Not, not too far from a place called Utsorn. So yes, uh, that, that's where they're from. And it's remarkable. This is our first South African species, and I think it's more than a coincidence that we have Rory Duff here today. It just happens to have synchronicity. <laughs> I just lived there for three years. So. This is remarkable. Uh, we're, we're, we love these kinds of coincidences. Um, they're meaningful to us, and I think there's something special about the fact that the elephants are um, hidden, that they are choosing not to be. Um, in the daylight, it's almost like they understand that there's a risk to themselves, that it's safer to come out. They've adapted their behavior, perhaps, to um, modern times so that they're not hunted into extinction. They may be aware of the fact that, they, that they're that nearly went extinct. But in any case, um, they're back, and that's a huge surprise to a lot of people. And this is the kind of thing that we are tracking as being aware that as humans at this time, maybe we can play a role in choosing the golden timeline, the golden age, regardless how things look, it's possible to see quantum jumps, which is the subject I write about, of course. So there's a good scientific reason why but I can go into that because it links to what, 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 I'm, what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, it, it's to do with the uh, increase in cosmic energy, which uh, mutates and, and uh, also um, kills cells, but it's, uh, it's, it's, very much linked to evolutionary steps in mankind when we have large amounts of cosmic cosmic energies coming through so we're getting that right now for reasons i'll go into and that's why we're seeing the uh, genes being reactivated and, and uh, dormant genes coming alive again and, and why you're getting uh, changes in species and, and yeah things like the, the white white very white variants of the his animals that you were mentioning and the we Oh gosh, we, we're seeing so many white variants, and there it's it's uh, what do you call it, leucism? So it's um, but it's just these unexpected uh, gene variations. Also, golden animals. A lot of those are coming in. <laughs> okay, let's do the next slide because take another animal. This one is adorable, and I was hoping we'd have Jerry Hicks with us today because he's, as you know, in Tennessee. And this was uh, the first spotted Fanaluca ever born in the United States of America. It arrived just last month at the Nashville Zoo. And I think part of the reason Jerry's not with us is he is doing a big move to Nashville sometime this month. And anyway, he had equipment problems, which is why he's not with us today. But the Fanaluca is a native to Madagascar, and it prefers to live in wooded areas. Again, I think we've got a nocturnal theme going because that last species of elephant is showing up at night now. I don't think it used to be nocturnal, but it's living that way now. And this creature also is nocturnal, has an average lifespan of 21 years. It's considered to be the second largest predator in Madagascar. And its diet includes small mammals, reptiles, bird eggs, aquatic animals, and insects. And of course, we love it um, for several reasons. Anything like a first, anything this cute, and then this golden color. This perhaps is its regular color. It's just that it's coming to our attention synchronistically. So we're paying attention to it and welcoming it um, to the world and hoping that it's joining us in this movement toward finding this golden age. Any thoughts, Shane? It sure is adorable. Other than that, I'm, I'm not familiar with this animal. It's brand new to me, but... It seems like, you know, there would have been like, a, I don't know, cartoons or something about something like this, you know, it's so cute. Right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. And that's why this is another featured Mandela effect, because I have never heard of a Fanaluca. Now, I don't expect I've heard of all the animal species on Earth, but something this cute, it seems like when you do book reports in school, somebody would have covered it at some point, you would have seen it. <laughs> or the animal documentaries and programs, but I've never heard of it. 
Or we might have one pop out of nowhere. You know, we've had that happen, right? Right. <laughs> So there might be a new cartoon series that pops in. And, and you know, you were talking about the cosmic energy, Rory, and I want to, later on, I want to get into how that could be affecting our consciousness, which could have something to do with, uh, you know, memories and Mandela effects and things like that. But they're the sponsors first. <laughs> Thank you. And Rory, any any observations, questions, comments, or thoughts? No, no I've, I've not come across this animal either, um, but... Um... It looks like it'd take your finger off if you'd wanted to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or a piece of it, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> looks cute, but it's a good guardian. Looks like a watch watch animal. It, it, it reminds me, I was um, I heard a news story in America about someone who had a pet squirrel and a burglar broke in and the squirrel was very it was a, it kept attacking the burglar, you know, just really annoying the burglar. It didn't it didn't tear it didn't cause too much damage, but it was surprising to see such a small little animal being so protective of the house when the humans were gone. Mm -hmm. And this, this little creature looks like it could do a lot more damage than a squirrel. So, yes. <laughs> it's cute, though. Just the fact that you wouldn't know what it is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next slide. We've got one more sponsor this month, and this is from the Plant Kingdom. This is a very beautiful, sometimes white, sometimes translucent, so-called skeleton flower. And it's also known more um, correctly as the Diphilia grayi. And it has petals that turn translucent and crystalline when wet, but when they're dry, they're just white. This is a species of perennial plant in the family, oh gosh, um, Berhiridevice, <laughs> that is mostly distributed in colder areas in the north of Japan. So it's not indigenous to the United States that I've seen. Um, I don't know if either of you have heard of it before. I think, Shane, you found this one, right? Or Actually, uh, I think uh, Ruth sent me this on Facebook, and I was like, oh, I've never seen these, but they aren't from this area, but they're, they're in so interesting. I can't imagine, you know, not coming across them before. Have you, are you familiar with this plant, Rory? Have you ever seen it before? Not, not at all, no. no. So neat looking. How it looks like ice or or you know glass or something, yeah. You know? And this sometimes these plants and animals can give us a message. And this is one I think you had some great observations, Shane. Yeah, transparency. Yeah. And and I think that's a big. Uh, I'm noticing that with what's happening with the new kids today, the crystal and indigo kids and so forth, that there is this transparency. I think we're seeing it in the new thinking, the way of thinking that. Um, there's more telepathy. There's more awareness that um, we we do know what you're thinking. I think in the past, people thought they could get away with things. And I know this is a plant, but it, it seems like it's showing us something. <laughs> and water is very important, too. When you pay attention to the symbolism of water and how sometimes there's an emotional quality, people recognize that emotions um, you know, can make things transparent. So if you bring this sort of a metaphor, if this was a dream symbol, how I would interpret this dream symbol is that when when we have emotional events we're all very transparent you know people know how we feel and that can be a good thing it, it's a thing <laughs> so it's something that can help us i think collectively when we recognize that we are cared for and we have others who care about us but maybe i'm reading too much into a plant <laughs> No, I totally agree with you. I think it could be a total indicator. I mean, that's it's just another um, sign of the synchronicity we talk about. You can see things appearing, uh, you know, symbolically and all sorts of things. And it's like the more you look, the more you see. So, yeah, I'm right on board with you, Cynthia. It also uh, links with uh, Rudolf Steiner's uh, characteristics that we're expected to find in the sixth epoch. And we're at the end of the fifth epoch in his terms at the moment and the first moral characteristic he talks about uh, refers to the increasing empathy and increasing telepathy so what you've just said would link with this and i think some people are already feeling greater empathy and telepathy which so you know yes it, it's a, another link <laughs> yeah yeah which directly relates with the transparency when you're telepathic right yeah that's perfect love it love it love it thank you so that's the end of our sponsors for this month, but not the end of our sponsors. I'm sure we'll have more. And thanks for those people who keep sending them to us. We love it. Okay, next slide, please. 
And now it's time for our updates. So my update, I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. I, I'm still publishing my monthly newsletters, doing my podcast. I do have a new episode coming out soon with Evan Alexander, the neurosurgeon that had a near-death experience. So I'll be posting on that on my newsletter, realityshifters.com. You can sign up for it and receive all the updates. And also, um, we have a newsletter for this organization, IMEC dot world and you can sign up for the newsletter here as well uh, the only other big thing is that i was with um thank you very much yeah i was with the crying on circle of 12 recently and that was beautiful getting to talk about the hopi prophecy rock um lee carroll had just come from the hopi prophecy rock coincidentally and it's so meaningful to me because of this um choice between like transhumanism and rev humanism so that that theme just keeps coming up and up. <laughs> but that's it for my update. And then Jerry Hicks, I told you he can't join us today, but I'm sure he would tell you that he loves you very much. And, um, you know, he's with us in spirit for sure. And Shane it comes to you. Absolutely. And I like that comparison you were talking about with the uh, uh, transhumanism versus the rev humanism. And uh, because uh, I've been doing the uh, studying the Wingmakers philosophy lately. And so I've been really busy with art. Um, I don't really have a big update, just doing personal sessions with people and working on some art, which hopefully I'll release pretty soon and share with everybody. And uh, maybe you so, can tell I love those Wingmakers, maybe just a brief explanation of what got you into that, why you're doing it, and how important yeah, it is. Yeah, I just stumbled across the story, and it's, uh, you know, sort of awakening through music and art to our sovereignty. And I felt like, you know, with my life being so involved with art and music and, uh, you know, with the, the doodle behind me, I, I noticed all sorts of things like after the fact that would come up that were synchronistic. And it made me realize that when you tap in with your artwork, whether, you know, whether it's writing or music or dance or anything, you're tapping into something beyond you and you can really become a conduit to like, uh, you know, sort of bring in more divine knowledge and energy. Uh, really depending on, you know, sort of your intentions or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really fun adventure and uh, yeah, sort of getting in the flow of things, you know. And those wing makers, those are mysterious writings, right, that were transcribed somewhere. And, and you've been right. doing a great job bringing them through video. Um, yeah, I've actually got a playlist on uh, my YouTube channel that sort of explains it or whatever. But it's all about awakening humanity to their greater potential, their, their greater, greater sovereignty and power that they all have within, you know. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Christopher Anatra is in Ibiza. So he's traveling right now. And that's exciting. But he is always working diligently, as you know. He's got all the Symphony of Realities videos. He's done, I think, several this last month. Not only that, he also has created, with the help of our producer behind the scenes today, Heather, a fabulous interview that we're going to show a five-minute clip from. And this is, um, maybe it's self-explanatory. So if we're ready, go ahead and play the clip, Heather. Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Anatra. You know me as the quantum businessman. Very special edition of IMEC today, the International Mandela Effect Conference. By the way, uh, welcome to everyone, everyone here on the panel, and everyone back at the at IMEC land, Shane and Jerry and Cynthia and the audience that watches us all the time, welcome. Uh, we have a very special uh, show for you today related to the Mandela effect and augmented reality with the Bristol, Connecticut library that's created a very unique special software application that's really capturing the imagination of people in that area. And I'm located in Connecticut. I'm in Brantford, Connecticut. They're in Bristol, Connecticut. So we kind of have like a hometown thing going on a little bit, but I wanted to introduce you to Seth, Susan, and Scott. What inspired you to create this, this augmented reality um, Mandela Effect game? I know your daughter was involved and so forth. Yeah, and my, my daughter, when she explained what the Mandela Effect was and she said, my generation loves this idea. I went, well, then we got to put it in because we need your generation in the library. Um, <laughs> I think I think some of it too had to do with the energy of the library. So it's it's a unique library in that it's been there for a while. It's been built on and added to, 
And there's occasionally some really interesting interactions with people who may or may not be there anymore. <laughs> so when I did a little research on the Treadway family, the Treadways owned the house that was originally, uh, it was like a temporary Bristol Public Library. And then they took the house out and they put in a permanent library. Um, Susie Treadway was the little girl who lived in the, that house and who every now and then seems to pop up and appear, um, we think, uh, throughout the library, along with possibly Charles Wooding, who was the first Bristol Public Library director. So there's some interesting energies that go on there. It's, it's a little bit of the history of the other Bristol library. Oh, uh, and parallel. Okay, it, gotcha. All right. right. Yeah, so you, you have the option. You don't have to watch it. You can still play the game without viewing it. But if you're really curious about the story of the Mandela effect and why it's there in the library, then you watch that video. The fact that, of course, this whole the whole game is based on the other library. Uh, Susan has been very good about taking real uh, characters from Bristol history, but the uh, what they say and do is not necessarily what they absolutely did during uh, in our timeline. Let's put it that way. So um, she's been very good about being accurate, but some of the actual game activities and whatnot involve um, interactions between the characters that that didn't necessarily well we don't know but they didn't they don't they probably did not happen in this timeline so the i think that this video sets the scene for the fact that this is a sort of historical fiction based on the mandela effect all right so for everyone that's interested we're going to play the video now the other library is powered by a time machine invented by joseph ives in 1830. the machine was intended to be a city clock for bristol as the gift from the knights templar when the invention went beyond expectations, the Templars hid the clock's powers while they worked to eliminate it. Bristol received the clock in 1840 and placed it in a central location. In 1897, it was relocated to the library. The move generated multiple parallel universes, so when it was announced in 1906 that a new library building would be built and the clock moved again, the Templars acted. The night before construction, a Templar left to destroy the machine. The plan was successful in our world, but the machine remained in the other Bristol, and a time bubble was created, running that world in a continual loop between the years of 1830 and 1906. The Templars continue to seek an end to the machine, but non-Templars also study it. Charles Wooding is the Looking Glass Machine's guardian. Well, I want to thank you all for sharing, you know, this project that you've been working on. Um, I know you've captured a lot of people's imagination and I hope some more people will come into the library in, in Bristol at the very least to try this out. Mm -hmm. And other libraries, we're gonna have your contact information. Uh, you might get some emails from other places around the country that wanna know more about what you've done and how they could do it. Great. So, terrific. Yeah, so on behalf of the International Mandela Effect Conference, thank you all very, very much. Thank you thank for you. inviting thank us. It's a pleasure. It. Thank you. And you can watch the full episode of this on Patreon. It is available when you become a Patreon supporter of IMAC, International Mandela Effect Conference. And this is just a fabulous presentation. It's worth watching the whole thing. It's it's great. Yes, yeah, so evidently they have this augmented reality where you can get this app on your phone and walk around with the camera. And it, you can see things on the screen that aren't really there and interact with them or whatever and it's like a sort of like a portal into another uh, universe um, of information so it sounds really interesting the way they have it set up um, but yeah you guys can watch the full episode on patreon as well as the green room um with uh, our last guest last absolutely week. yeah the green room with um dr donald hoffman is already available and i think friday will be the premiere of this um the full feature of this Bristol Library Mandela Effect game. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that conversations that we have back before the show starts, we just did one today with Rory yeah. Duff, and it's really worth catching that so you can get the in extra information and have fun with us behind the scenes. Absolutely. So let's do our next slide and take a look at, um, here we have the reminder that if you have not yet voted, we'd love you to come and please um, check out the this um, opportunity to 
participate in the Golden Mandy survey, this is your chance to help vote for the favorite Mandela effect that you experienced. Could be the Mandela effect that shocked you the most. And we'd love to know who you feel deserves the Golden Mandy. Last year, we did award this prize to um, Brie Brunage, and she was a high schooler who did this fabulous presentation for a TED Talk, quite inspirational. So if you've got one that you think is deserving, please let us know. And that's the link right there. And the next slide, here we go. This is the main show today, and now I get to formally um, honor our guest Rory Duff with a proper introduction. And Rory Duff is a geobiologist who has spent the last 15 years studying geobiology and mapping some of the most powerful energy lines that encircle the earth, finding locations of sacred sites where people can go to prepare for the great separation event. And then his website is roryduff.com. He has a fabulous newsletter, lots of wonderful events and it's well worth signing up for receiving the newsletter. Each one is just a treat. It's like Christmas. You get to see all kinds of good information. And welcome, Rory, for being with us today. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia, Shane. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. So you can, if you'd like to just start off and maybe explain what this great separation is. I think um, a lot of people may not have heard that term. Today, we've been talking about Rudolf Steiner and the sixth epoch or age. Um, is it related to that? Uh, he did actually refer to the separation occurring, yes. Um, and it, it can mean several different things, but there's, there's definitely a, a separation in the way people are thinking and, 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 and connecting and awakening. And as, an, as an, uh, also a connection to uh, consciousness and uh, how we perceive things um, by the way we connect to uh, the spiritual energies and, and uh, one of the things about the epochs that he talked about is that uh, there's no uh, com complete move from one epoch to the next it's, so there's a slow transition which occurs in pockets geographically around the world and that is actually also seemingly linked to the, the development of the human potential in certain places or the lack of human potential in, in other places so what what we're terming that this great separation is not necessarily something that's that's permanent. It's just that it's a, a separation for the moment until the rest of the world, if you like, catch up with uh, with the changes that are going on. And and uh, what appears to to be happening is that this separation has already begun. Um, how it links to the prophecies, how it links to Earth energies is something which uh, I didn't obviously know about initially because the first time was, was uh, when I noticed something strange with the Earth energies. Uh, I should perhaps explain more about that uh, and how that works. Where, where to begin to start? Uh, um, yeah, as a, for, for those of you who aren't aware, geobiology is the study of how the Earth affects life. Uh, and in particular, my interest is how the inner core of our earth affects those beings living on the surface of the earth that now means well what's the question is what what is this about the inner core that that can do this and um, that came about after really spending many years just mapping these earth energy lines and then looking at them uh, on an hourly basis in case in some cases working out why they were where they were and why they moved the way they did and, and where they were found um one of, one of the early uh, observations made not, not by myself was that uh, the, the energy lines seem to run through very uh, very much either modern or ancient places of prayer so they would, they would go through both uh, cathedrals like in chartres and yet also they'd go through places like avery stone circle and it would it would appear that where people gathered to pray and meditate, you also find these these intersections of these energy lines. What what uh, I think my work initially began to, to to find out when I was mapping these lines is that they they were weren't all the same thing. They had different frequencies, and uh, the frequencies are, are 
are determined by the way the lines move one way and back the other way uh, in between the intersections and just by moving backwards and forwards it gives them a frequency but, but some of the wider more powerful and rarer lines move a lot more slowly than the smaller ones that seem to move slightly faster would it be okay to play a clip at this point? I'd love to play. We have a couple of short clips from an excellent documentary that Rory has created called Holy Grail Found. And if you guys have not seen it, definitely check that out. Um, so if, with your permission, I'd like to play just a very short 30 second clip. This is about, um, this clip will talk a little bit about what you're discussing right now. And it's, it's you, of course, <laughs> but it's wonderful. Okay, that shows the that the solid inner core of the earth could be the source of these sounds. This iron nickel core seems to be behaving like a transducer. A transducer converts one type of energy into another. Typically they are found in microphones and loudspeakers, changing sound into electricity and back again. In the case of the earth's core, it is theoretically possible that gravitational energy and or electrical energy is being converted into sound energy. What supports this idea is that it's known that iron and nickel acts as a mechanical filter. In other words, it only emits certain sound frequencies. The rest are filtered out. And this is exactly what we find on the surface of the Earth. So, so my first question is how, is this sort of related with the Schumann resonance as well, in your opinion, or, or from your research? Um, the Schumann resonance uh, is affected by the same changes that we're experiencing but it's uh more up in the uh ionosphere that we we get those effects as opposed to uh the inner core which is being affected uh, actually not by gravity that was the original thinking but what mm -hmm. uh, what's come about is uh and i'll come to it later it's this cosmic energy that's doing this um but the electromagnetism around the outer core provides the electromagnetic actual energy that's transduced by the inner core which then sends out spherical vibrations so when i use the word sound actually it's it's m below the audible uh, range of hearing that we call sound these are very very slow expansion and contractions of the inner core and we're talking about uh, nine to ten microhertz which is below what we can even measure with super cool gravimeters so it, it's a uh, and and, and that yet those spherical bubbles of vibration go out through the earth, bouncing off different density contrasts of different layers of rocks. Uh, and we know from the way sound goes, there's a high pressure wave and then a low pressure wave. But when you start looking at how that presents itself on the surface, you get linear zones of high pressure. And there's a link again, and they're all intersecting in certain places. So there's a link here with uh, um, what we're finding on the surface, which is these energy lines, but they're not lines. They're actually uh, high pressure areas within low pressure field. So it, it, it's, it, it's, they exist everywhere, except the high pressure element is, is picked up as a line. And, and they run in pairs as well. Uh, this particular group of Earth energies anyway, that they, they run in pairs, which again is linked to standing wave effect of going out and back. So they're parallel to each other when they come in pairs like that? The, the, the alignment that they follow is pretty straight, but these pairs of lines come together and apart and come together and apart. And, and the typical example most people know is the St. Michael alignment that runs from Cornwall in the UK up to the other coast in the North Sea in East Anglia. And that, that has the St. Michael line and the St. Mary line weaving its way along the alignment and where it crosses over you have in places like glastonbury avebury uh, and royston and uh, that that where they cross is is where these uh, ancient or modern uh, sacred sites are where people gather to pray and meditate so um the the, the major change though um when, when you when we worked out there are different groups of lines that means there are different fields uh, which don't have too much bearing on them. But the every four times a year, we found that all the frequencies started moving together from side to side. It was a, it was a narrow band of just over half a day when the ends of the lines all hit the end of their range of movement at precisely the same time. 
and then again the other way at precisely the same time. And what was strange for years is we I didn't understand why this brief harmony time was always the day before the solstices and the equinoxes. And I kind of thought, well, why is it not on the solstices and the equinoxes? Well, it, it turns out that the, uh, the the old Hebrew holy day, which was handed down by word of mouth since the Bronze Age and probably the Stone Age, was called the Tekufa, which is the last day of the sun cycle. And that was uh, uh, the day before the first day of the new sun cycle, which is the solstices and the equinoxes. So the old Hebrew holy day and the old holy day before that was always the last day of the sun cycle the, the day before and that's exactly when the harmony time was there and so it then progresses to thinking well what's happening at these sacred sites and there when you start mapping these lines on a, on a dimension of, of, of vertically vertically above uh, you find that it's it's three-dimensional shape changes from being a column of energy normal normally uh, it, that column on those four harmony times collapses into a double torus. In fact, the symbols double toruses. But that double torus energy shape has huge implications when you have a resonant connection with that, with your own double torus energy shape and your own uh, 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 torus vort vortex ring in your heart. You, you can allow you with certain sounds and chanting to to create a resonance between you and the earth energies when that happens it seems to uh, lower the perceptual barriers so that we can move into greater clearer conversations between our conscious and our subconscious mind and the, that that now links the mind to these energy line sites and then we have to start looking at consciousness and that, that opens a big can of worms but if we go back to the to the before we go down that route we should go back to what happened in 2017 because um when you monitor these things you, you begin to look at the patterns over time and you get used to seeing what's going on but suddenly in 2017 a, a group of us all found that the lines doubled in the width just like that and how did you discover that you're out there dousing i take it um... Uh, well, well, actually, I got contacted by someone who said, you know, there's something strange happening to the lines today because we have a sort of small network. Do you want to check them? And I checked it. This is, this is crazy. It's sort of twice the width. So I, I sent a, a, a text and a message out to people I know saying, check, check the lines, will you, and tell me what you find. And, and all of them came back and said, yeah, well, they doubled in their width. What's going on? Well, there's a well, huge connection with this and um, our community, the Mandela Effect people, a lot of them. Came in, I think you, Shane, maybe around 2017. Yeah, and, and here's the thing about a week before the equinox, and here's the thing I find uh, with a lot of people: they seem to sort of it's it seems to click with them that you know this strange thing called the Mandela effect is actually happening, and it seems to sort of happen to them right around the equinox or right before the equinox. I've discovered. Um, they sort of just kind of like like for me it was like i'd heard about it for about a year mm -hmm. and then for mm -hmm. some reason you know it just came into my awareness so real and um and paradigm shattering in a way mm -hmm. you know uh like an awakening of sorts yeah. and uh you know it, it is it, 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 and it and it introduces the the biggest subject the world's not talking about well, what is that you gotta let's go there you can forget climate science, you can climate change, you can forget viruses and vaccines. They're all paling into significant into insignificance when you start looking at what's really going on with one thing, and that's the Earth's magnetic field. We are in a process where the Earth's magnetic field is in rapid decline. That's our protection against cosmic energies. And so when did this uh, come to your attention? Would this be related to the 2017 or? Well, um, it, that that was related to it uh, as well as uh, reports from the Ibex explorers, uh, other probes that had gone beyond the heliosphere and had been picking up uh, changes in uh, the, the uh, magnetism outside of that. Uh, what they discovered some time ago was that uh, uh, an unexpected magnetic field called the local interstellar cloud existed just on the outside of the solar system. And it appears that we were exiting this. Um, 
and, a, and an interstellar magnetic field is what shields us from uh, cosmic energies. So we, we have three shields, the, the, this local cloud, the sun's magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic field. Um, but there's a lot of question marks in, in science right now. That science, mainstream science, would love to tell you it's all done and dusted. We know everything, but that's a complete and utter lie. <laughs> we know uh, that. <laughs> you, and I mentioned earlier about uh, my friend Ron Pearson, who'd spent 24 years coming up with a new theory on the, on the creation of the universe. And he, he basically also went on to find a full theory of quantum gravity, which actually didn't need relativity theory. And when you start looking at relativity theory, that has been a, a, a massive deception being placed on mankind because it completely eradicated the need for any background medium, which, which we used to know as the ether. Something that the great Nikola Tesla, who wanted to light the world, who probably could have lit the world with free electricity, completely supported the ether. But the problem with that was you couldn't put a meter on it, you couldn't charge it, and it threatened the oil uh, barons and, and their oil trade. And if you can imagine uh, every single country in the world being energy independent, it would take their power and their money immediately away from them. So they they, they, they did it really cleverly, actually. What they did is they they, they saw relativity as, a, as an answer to their dreams, but, and they massively promoted any research in relativity with large funds to the extent that you couldn't get funding for any investigation into the ether and the background medium. So it wasn't before long that all the money and all the main institutions were investigating this ridiculous absurdity of, of relativity theory. And, and, and although the proponents of it says, oh, it's wonderful, it does all this, yes, but it doesn't fit with quantum theory. And you're left with, in order to try and fit quantum theory of relativity, you're coming up with ridiculous absurdities like multiple universes all appearing and disappearing without explaining where the energy comes from. You're, you're talking about multiple dimensions without explaining how that's possible. And you don't need multiple dimensions. It's only an invention to try and fit these two totally incompatible theories. But they've been trying to fit them together for 70, 80 years. And we have to chuck out relativity. Of course, they won't. They've been trying to adapt quantum theory for years. So when, when, when Ron Pearson finally comes along and, and, and basically doesn't just slaughter that holy cow, he, he slaughters the holy cow of consciousness by saying that uh, actually, you know, w w your mind isn't just part of brain function. It's actually uh, something bigger than that. And, and we all survive after death, which, of course, is the other big thing. If you take away the, the, the fear of death, it's like, uh, you can't control people anymore. That's the whole control mechanism the church has had and the politicians used fear. Uh, so that was another aspect which uh, came through uh, Ron's work. It came unexpectedly to him as well because uh, he was trying to come up with a... Uh, he'd, he'd started off by, by pointing out a, a glaring mistake to the scientists in the Big Bang theory. Uh, which of course you know everyone just totally accepts that, that this is this is the, the accepted way the universe began no it's just it's actually an engineering logical impossibility uh, Ron, Ron would point out if there are flaws in the maths almost on every line of the big bang and Alan Guth's inflation theory was 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 had to they had to give him a Nobel Prize for that just to try and shut up the criticism uh, so the Big Bang Theory could not possibly have worked, and I haven't got a lot of time to go into the, all the problems with the Big Bang Theory, because there's lots. Uh, he came up with a new theory called the, 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 um, the Big Breed Theory of the, of the, that created the universe. But he had this rather unfortunate side effect of also explaining how intelligence must have arisen <laughs> that went on to create the, the quantum worlds. And uh, his theory doesn't need lots of dimensions. It only needs three dimensions. But what's wonderful is it can it, it, in in the sub quantum world where the intelligent ether exists, it creates many different matter frequency systems. So all the quantum worlds all sit in the same area that we are in now, but on a different frequency of matter. But our mind, just as it only tunes into a range of hearing and a range of seeing, we can't see ultraviolet and infrared. It tunes into a range of feeling. But there are other fields outside that range of feeling. And these exist on different matter frequencies, all in the same area. And when our mind 
which is a fragment of the universal mind, uh, has no more use for this physical body. It goes into another one of these worlds, these spirit worlds. So it, it, it explains the existence of these spirit worlds. It explains the existence of beings on these other worlds. And we're not talking about the aliens from outer space. They're, they're here now, but on a different frequency. Goodness, and, and we've got a bit of a rabbit hole there. But, but um, what we've well, got is... It, if people are interested in reading this, have you helped? You said you helped write some of this with Ron Pearson. Is that well, correct? I didn't write it, but uh, okay. it, it soon became obvious to me. We met synchronously, and um, yes. I was really keen to 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 get answers myself. Um, and he'd come up with this incredible theory, and, and I went up to to meet him, and I, I interviewed him, and re recorded that, and realized that I had to spend more time trying to understand his work in detail, and, and he. He was no way equipped to be able to talk down to the average person about what his theories were about. He, 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 if you start listening to people like that, when they really get talking with other top scientists, it's like, whoa, what are they saying? What are they talking about? So there was this process of, 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 of condensing it down into manageable chunks and then helping him write these six books, which uh, it starts at the sort of O-level beginning and takes you up to sort of the you know, professor uh, you know, masters and, and, and uh, PhD level uh, physics and cosmology. Uh, so he has a complete theory, uh, all the maths and, and predict experiments. Uh, and and more important, I actually spent time getting this work in front of Professor uh, Brian Josephson, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist yes. at the Cavendish Labs in, in Cambridge University, who finally admitted he couldn't find any flaws in it, but he didn't like it because it didn't contain relativity theory. So we have this theory of Ron's, which explains how intelligence arose in the universe. It, it's it's a sub-quantum level existence, which is based on waves and vibrations. Uh, and it, it, it explains um, different frequency systems, matter frequency worlds. It explains how the mind survives after death. Um, and all the, all the things like healing and everything else will, will roll into it. And um, so how do we get onto this? Yeah. <laughs> Well, this, this is such a big topic. I think we were talking about what sounded a little bit like cymatics there. Um, just this, yeah, that cymatics is a two-dimensional aspect. And you were, of yeah, uh, and I think um, people people have seen cymatics. They go on YouTube, yeah. they check that out. It's so cool. They yeah. see like sand on a table vibrating. And, I'm taking a slice across the energy field. Okay. And that, But I'm, I want to go there so people can get that image yeah. and sense like what you're talking about in 2017. You heard a report like these energy waves, these standing wave patterns are getting bigger. And that's exactly, but this is on the earth. So there's something yeah, yeah. like this, yeah, this amazing resonance happening. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and at the nodes, the, those those patterns, by the way, with the three dimensional patterns, yes. uh, when you start seeing how they change, that's that's actually uh, brings in a, a nice connection with what we find on the ceiling of the Monsoon Chapel. Actually, yeah. Would it because, be possible to play a clip yeah, here? Because, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what it's called. It's on okay. the top of the ceiling. The Templars Let's... knew of these changing energy shapes at these sacred sites, and Monsoon is one of the most powerful sacred sites in France. So we're setting yeah. up a clip here. Thank you, Rory. Um, this is another clip that Heather's going to play. She's got it cued, and it's from The Holy Grail Found, which is that documentary that we're playing two clips from today, again, by Rory Duff. So play clip, please, Heather. Why this would be significant to the Templars and the people before them who have thought that these intersections were important sacred places still needs to be looked at much more closely. So, if what the Templars were looking for were ancient sacred sites, we have to ask why they might have wanted to find these things. For possible answers to this, we can turn to the Templar window at Calavaccia de la Cruz and learn more from a completely new interpretation of its hidden message. As was mentioned earlier, one of the founders of the Templar Knights was Bernard of Clairvaux. In Bernard's early life as a Cistercian monk, he would have become aware of their customs and ways. This would have included their secret ways of communication. The research team found that four of the symbols around the Templar window looked very similar to those used in a Cistercian number cipher. The cipher, though, used to superimpose the symbols for numbers all around one central vertical line. Around the window, it looked as though they'd been individually separated to match and fit in with the other symbols. With the understanding that ciphers can slowly evolve over time, this enabled the team to establish a likely date for when the window was filled in and for when the coded message was put up. 
The central vertical line would now have been representing a thousand. The vertical line with the diagonal line going up from the bottom now represented 300. And the one and the three are vertical lines again with an added short line at the top. The date that emerged was 1313 AD, which was very soon after the Templar Order was disbanded by the Pope. At that time, it seems that the Templars had wanted to leave an important message to their followers. To do that, though, they'd have to explain to the Roman Church and the local congregation why they were putting these symbols up around the window, and also what they meant. So if they'd wanted to put up a secret message, they'd had to disguise it with an open one that was acceptable to everyone. This meant that some of the key symbols would have needed to have a double meaning, an open and more obvious one, and then a secret one. If you look at the centre of the window, at the shapes with the flowers behind the glass, we find that they've been made to look like four angels flying around the centre. The reason for this seems to be twofold. Firstly, it represents one of the miracles that Caravaccio was known for. Several angels were said to have flown down from heaven with a piece of the true cross, which was needed for a ceremony to convert a Moorish king over to Christianity. We didn't get into the, um, the big reveal. I didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to give everything away from your excellent documentary, but if you well, want to... No, yeah, do, do watch the documentary, but if you want to delve deeper, I've got a book, uh, Grail Found which uh, really goes into the connection with the Templars and the Earth Energy Lands and Sacred Science. And the sequel to that, Grail Bound, introduces you to, uh, actually introduces you more to what's going on with the prophecies and how that's linking to this moment in time right now. And also introduces Ron Pearson's work in a bit more detail. But um, it, it essentially, yeah, that, that plays Cadillac is just the most amazing, uh, we call it a fourth order now, there's two, two pairs of very strong lines crossing there, and the Templars knew about that. And in that, that where that place, that window is, when you go there, uh, there are clues in, in the corners of that small chapel with Latin inscriptions. And one of them, I'll, I'll tell you now, which I don't mention on that, is, is uh, it's a picture of a, of a font with a dove flying of it. And the Latin underneath is Lavacrum Sacrum, which is sacred bathroom. So that place was like bathing in the sacred energies. Wow. And it was built on a vertical tower and they had five rooms all the way up and they, they, could, they could actually meditate and pray on any one of these rooms. And this is very similar to what the Templars did in lots of other places. Uh, you'll find that the, uh, the, the towers in in, in, um, in in Portugal like that and wells, initiation wells going down for the same reason because there, there are stacked toruses above, above each other and you get a different effect where you meditate and pray. In fact, we're still learning how group meditation works, but uh, we need to get back to the, the actual, uh, the widening of the lines in 2017 and why that happened and how that links to the, the decreasing magnetic field. Um, we, 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 we found that the, the most likely reason for uh, the occurrence of uh, the largest lines that we found in the world um, had to do with galactic energies. And, and before 2017, we had th three pairs of extremely powerful lines that circumvented the world. We call them the Emperor Dragons type five lines. And these three lines intersected, intersected each other on the land in, in four places, and they are in places of incredible power. And we think this is the same as Seth's, Seth's uh, absolute coordinate points. And Seth is the, is the one that uh, Jane Roberts was channeling in, and wrote about in her book, Seth Speaks. So they're, they're, they're incredibly powerful places. But, but in 2017, when these lines all started doubling in width, uh, not only did all the lines double in the width, but we started getting new emperor dragons appearing. And you've got to start thinking, well, what's the source energy for suddenly switching on and off these lines? And the only thing that made sense was some form of energy had to come through the earth and be put into the transducer in the inner core, which wasn't there before. And the only high energy particle that could do this is a neutrino. And we know that neutrinos pass through earth in, in, in microseconds, but 
down in Antarctica, there's ice cube, there's this observation stations called the ice cube that have got all these holes drilled down into to the ice there. And, and they pick up something called Cherenkov radiation, which is at, happens when a neutrino passes through their array of, of uh, sensors down these holes. So they, 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 they track these uh, uh, particles uh, to help them build up a picture of the interior of the Earth and what's going on. They call it acoustic tomography. So we know that these uh, neutrinos are slightly impart energy to the inner core. And if it parts energy, they call that's been transduced. So the next question is, well, how do the neutrinos get to, to the inner core? Uh, and what happens with cosmic energy is that when it hits our atmosphere, it splits into gamma rays and neutrinos. You, that, that's where the source of your neutrinos is. If you've got more cosmic energy coming in, you suddenly get more neutrinos. And with the shields coming down, with the local solar system exiting the local cloud, uh, suddenly it's like a whole new beam of energy is coming into the Earth. And that then uh, allowed uh, three new sources of energy to eventually come in. Well, that, that made three more emperor dragons enter the world. Three new fields of energy, sources of energy. When one of them was the center of our, our we think is the center of our, our, our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and by the way, um, the, the next really big thing which people don't talk about <laughs> is uh, if in increasing cosmic energy is hitting the atmosphere, and I did mention it before with regards to uh, uh, evolutionary trends um you, you you can you can go back and looking at uh, ice cube uh, ice core uh, samples and looking at uh, brilliant 14 isotope ratio levels and, and when you have increases in that isotope you, you you know there's more cosmic energy that's been getting through to the environment and and the peaks where there's more cosmic energy when you look back through geological time it may be 15 50 60 thousand years coincide with evolutionary leaps that we're aware of in, in, in the geological record. So uh, cosmic energy is evolutionary. We know that. Uh, it, it, it can affect the heart, it can affect the mind, it affects the DNA in our cells. So it it's, has the ability to, to reactivate our genes. And that's an, another way of potentially explaining why we're, we're finding uh, species returning because it's probably similar species that have had other dormant genes activated and they're re now, now coming out and looking like the old species in, in that sense. But this, this cosmic energy has a, a rather interesting, <laughs> I mentioned neutrinos, but it also produces gamma ray radiation. This is so interesting. Big, I, I, the first science report I ever did was seventh grade, um, 1970s something. Three. <laughs> and it was my first oral report, and I was talking about um, these cycles that you're talking about, exactly this, the mass die-offs. I was looking at coral reefs and the, the the amazing pattern that was like, it was just so rhythmic, like exactly what you're saying. And I, I could see from, I drew a chart showing this, and I gave a report in my science class, and I was the mm -hmm. only one that gave an oral report, and everybody else was like, I don't want to do that. I yeah. was a very shy child, but I thought, okay, I've got to do this. It seems so important. And and I, I noticed at that time in the 1970s, it didn't seem like people were paying proper attention to the rhythm of these mass die-offs and this mass evolutionary epics, you know, that, that happen. Rhythm so, is everything. We're, we're in cycles within cycles within cycles. And now we're beginning to look back at how that affects the epochs, the great yugas. And, and we have to look into astronomy now. So what's causing these cycles? And I'll come back to that in a minute. But I wanted to just ask you, you know, uh, this is a, this is not meant to be a trick question. But uh, and I don't mean to be, you know, that this is not a nice subject in some way. But what is killing people with regards to this virus? What is oh. killing people? Oh, you're asking us uh, our opinion, or um, is, to me, is it the virus that kills? Yeah, it? I, I would say most uh, the people that I'm looking. I, I went through long COVID, and I, it looks like there's a toxin that interacts with our bodies. So you know, if you look at the spike protein, then you're looking at um, something that has an amyloidosis. Oh, it, it triggers amyloidosis. Forget the, uh, yeah. forget the vaccines for a minute. The, the, it's the actual methodology. See, a, a, a virus doesn't really want to kill the host because it right. just create its own demise but it's not the virus that kills us it's the effects of the virus that can kill us and the effects of the virus is 
it causes internal inflammation in the organs so that it, we can't get oxygen to the organs. So the organs die from oxygen starvation. That's what kills us. There's a kind of proteinopathy that occurs from a specific component that's toxic uh, that may or may not have been lab created. <laughs> the whole thing gets sticky. True. True. <laughs> but, but I mentioned this lung inflammation right? because there's a very well-known problem for radiotherapy patients. And they, they, they're treating radiotherapists and they're testing them now with things like uh, hydroxychloroquine and hydroxychloroquine or to try and reduce the lung inflammation, which is what's killing the radiotherapy patients. So what we're finding is that the same symptoms of, of cause of death, which are attributed to the, to the virus, lung in, uh, inflammation and lack of oxygen, is exactly the same as gamma ray radiation. Ah, okay. Now That's when you start looking, when you start looking at the high levels of death geographically, one area stands out, and that's Brazil. It has a higher number of deaths from from supposedly the virus, and it, a lot of it probably was the virus. But why is there an extra amount per capita, per hundred thousand, in in Brazil than anywhere else? And if you start adding in the fact that a very similar cause of death is radiation poisoning, you then say, well, where's that coming from? How, how, do, how does Brazil suddenly get more radiation than anywhere else? And why, why would that be a place? And then you start looking at the magnetic field. And what a lot of people don't know is that the magnetic North Pole, which sat for, for many, many years above Canada, is now rapidly heading towards the Russian coast. The, the, the southern magnetic pole used to be at Antarctica area. It's now left Antarctica. And the north and south pole are heading towards each other in the, in the Indian Ocean. Now, these are... The yeah, I don't know if you follow the Hopi uh, mythology of the twins that they um, that they play a role at these epical times of the, you know, leaving the fourth world, going into the fifth is what the Hopi talk about. The Hopi Indians in America. Hopi yes, by, by the woman's uh, grandchildren were known as Pelongahoyer and Pogangahoyer, and that yes. the god of the North Pole and the god of the South Pole. Yes, and so, and the twins and, are, are the poles, or some people would say that that, that there's something going on with with this movement that the twins. We're expected to move, and this is that time yeah. of transition. And, and, and uh, in 2017, the fourth emperor dragon that uh, appeared ran from pole to pole. Wow. I was going to ask and, you where the fourth one appeared. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it ran pole to pole. Actually, run through the east eastern states. Uh, it goes up through, through that, uh, 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 yeah, and it goes down through Peru and, and that area. But the interesting thing about that is if you're looking at the Hopi uh, Blue Kachina uh, prophecy, Yes. Uh, it's seven years from the arrival of the twins. And wow. that comes to December 2024. And that links to exactly the same time when the harmony structure, that harmony period is now extending. It went from one day to three days to six days. It's now at 15, 16 days long. You're talking about the, the equinoxes and the solstices here, these yeah. harmony. Okay. How many times have been growing since since the arrival of the twins and the two other emperor dragons, which we can come to, th this whole energetic environment has changed. And it looks like we're going to have one all year round period of harmony by December 2024. Wow. Which, uh, I think uh, astrologers like uh, Pam Gregory and Heather Emsworth have actually started uh, also seeing from a different angle with regards to Pluto, Neptune, I think it is. It's good that that's uh, uh, beginning to, to come into full force at that point. So we're, what we're going to get at that point is not some fantastic change, but it's the start of all the Earth energy lines being in harmony for at least 200 years. And we we know why it's going to be that long. Wow. Because oh, tell, you got to tell us why. You start yeah. looking at the mechanism that's behind what's driving this cosmic energy right. and uh there is a, and you have to look at cycles for when this happens uh, and you've got to also dismiss some of the ridiculous science unfortunately and, and you're back into something called um, plasma cosmology and understanding that we're living in an electric universe uh, right. and the sun itself has something called a, a heliospheric current sheet the Earth passes through it every eight to ten days. It takes two minutes to pass through it. It gives yeah, us a big yang. 
could you, could you tell us a little bit about the sun magnetic fields and if you're noticing changes there? You mentioned the Earth, of course, is changing. You said there are three protections. Well, the, the important thing about the sun's magnetic field, it, yeah, it, it rises and falls uh, in, in connection with the uh, the fact that the, the, the poles on the sun change every 11 years. And the way that it does that is the north, it, it weakens and the north pole moves around to meet the south pole. And suddenly an opposite pole comes across the other side and then it completely flips. So it flips on the sun every 11 years. In, 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 the, in our world, it probably does it every 200,000 years. But what we're finding with this North Pole and the South Pole rushing towards each other, meeting in the, in the southern, uh, in, in, the, in China Sea, we're getting the opposite pole on the other side of the world building up as a big black magnetic low anomaly, which has got even less magnetic uh, protection. And guess where that's sitting? I don't know. Where, uh, where you were just mentioning, uh, South America? Where, where did Brazil. you say? Yeah. Brazil. Brazil. Brazil yeah. Oh, shoot. So you've got, this, you've got this magnetic no anomaly right. with no protection from cosmic energy and an above average amount of uh, uh, lung inflammation problems causing early death, which probably have been wrongly attributed to other causes. Or, or partially one to the other. So we're going through what is potentially one of this magnetic incursion or a magnetic reversal, which which happens uh, in connection to the galactic current sheet. So I talked about the heliospheric current sheet, which we run through every eight to 10 days, and we take two minutes to go through, which throws energy straight to the inner core. It goes ding, like not knocking the, the inner bell of our earth. Well, the galactic current sheet is also in existence. But the solar system passes through it roughly every 12,000 years. That's a big cycle. It doesn't take two minutes to go through the current sheet. It takes 200 years. But we're going to get a knock on, on, on our, our bell, which is going to bring out one frequency. That means all the energy lines frequencies are stabilizing at uh, uh, the frequency linked to the, the, the emperor dragons, which is opening, if you like, the connections to the highest realms, if you're going down that route. That produces a, a stable learning environment for us when we meditate at these energies. So we, our ability to begin to really learn from these distance learning schools, which are they, which they're considered these sacred sites, is is going to be phenomenal. And that's when our evolution is really going to be taking off because uh, the energetic environment is in those seven years from the Hopi or Indian arrivals coming to, to December twenty fourth is building. We're getting waves of increasing energy. But uh, this galactic current sheet's not just cosmic energy, it's it's a dust cloud, it's also a plasma. And it's the approaching plasma field to the solar, solar, this, the solar system that's affecting magnetic fields. And that's why it's decreasing. So we're, we're getting this uh, cyclic effect, which is reducing our magnetic fields. It's increasing cosmic energy. It's definitely uh, mutational. It's, it's, it's causing those problems. It's causing uh, 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 radiation problems in certain pockets. Um, and, and it has all the benefits as well because it, it's massively increasing the waves of energy at these uh, sacred sites, which is, is, is now taking us on another evolutionary journey through because it affects our minds and our consciousness. And this is what you know, Steiner talks about is leading towards this evolution of consciousness. And something you do, Rory, with your um, groups and events is that you gather people together at these nodes in England. And I guess we have vortices in America. We've got more vortices than nodes or something like that. But uh, what is the what can we do when we know that we're in these great times? There's so much change happening. As you say, there um, people are at greater risk, like in Brazil. Um, yeah. What is it? that what, what can we do and what are you doing with these groups that can be helpful? Well, the, the the first thing is to start recognizing the trends that we're in. And, and for me, it's also listening to the greats of our past who were able to, to see things in the future. And as soon as you have large cycles in the universe, you, you, you have a case for prophecy. If a prophecy is linked to a long-term cycle uh, and people can see these things, we can look back at our, our prophecies. Uh, the really incredible universal prophecies, the Quero Indian prophecy, the Maitreya prophecy, the Hopi Indian prophet prophecy. Uh, th there's a whole list of them, which I, I, I won't go into that now, but they're, they're all giving us clues as to how how we're going to experience changes, what's going to happen, how we should prepare. 
Um, but, but apart from just moving from individual consciousness to back into group consciousness, and that's another uh, cycle and, and the implications of that, we have to read Steiner. What we're re also moving from is uh, centralization to decentralization. And this is beginning to give us an indication of why we're having so many problems in this world, because our natural and energetic environment is to be decentralized, to be free, free from our control structures. Uh, and what's really frightening the, the would be controllers of these world and the, this one world government thing is they've got their hands on social media. They know exactly how many people are waking and it frightens them out of their minds. They don't want us to find out about it because the more of us are, are doing this, that more it has this sort of morphic resident effect. It just it grows and grows and grows. But it's not about one person or one group. It's about small groups locally. And that's what we have to try and do because you're going to get the answers locally that are relevant for your groups it's not one answer fits all because part of this evolution is is our own inner inner journeys and, and building our own our own strengths up where we have weaknesses so we're going to get different instructions generally but the, what i'm trying to do is to well I'm, we're creating a new website called the sacred network which aims to get knowledge of where these sacred sites are in the world and uh, helping people form groups and to, to, to create regular group meditations at these sacred sites um, um, we're, we're, it, it's, it's nearly been built we've got to test it it's been put on an encrypted network and then the content's got to go on so we're hoping it's going to be finished by, by uh, for first testing by the end of july for, for, for certain numbers of people and then we'll, by september october it'll be open for everybody but that'll be a vehicle for people to find well i want to go to these sacred sites where's the nearest one for me who is who is running these things or indeed i want to run one at these sites you know and i want to form a group and and then there's discussion forums and, and, and various things like that so it's, it's about uh, getting that message across that yes you all you have to do is connect locally and, and, and it, it's it's a very much a, a multi-faith spiritual message this is not a, a, a an a moderate message you know so it's not a sort of extremist thing it's any any and, and there are an amazing number of uh, moderate thinking uh, spiritual people from all religions and all, all cultures and they're the ones we need to get together but the strange thing is they're already doing this their meditations all around That's the world but when you do it on the sacred sites in groups it's so much more powerful <laughs> and if you then just surrender to the energies and the universal consciousness and 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 allow that to be the great teacher they'll that'll teach you what you need to know you can't you, can, you know, we haven't got time to read the books <laughs> but we, we have got time to find out and discover about who we are and that's another really important thing in in, in, in group meditation is and, and and it actually stems from um, when you start looking at the centers of the lines you find that different people find the lines in slightly different positions mm. and when you get six exactly the right different people and they really are different people it's not like we've got a party we're all the same people all getting in water there are six people who wouldn't normally get on you know but when you get people to overcome their differences and and they all find the centers of these lines and where they intersect and you look up you find you made a perfect circle and just like the, the the middle of the labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral, there are six little alcoves in the middle of the labyrinth where the node is. And it's like the temple is new. It's important to be in your place, not in the center, but, but right around the center. And that's where you're standing now in the right vortex ring when the torus shape forms. But these torus shapes, these vortex rings are going to be there 24, 7, 365 days a year. It's just going to be constant booming out energy there's just nothing that's going to be able to stop this but the trick here is we have to prepare and and, and this is where the separation comes in so those who are who are who, whose journey it is to prepare for this will go on this learning curve and then you begin to realize actually okay you, you you've got weaknesses you have you're going to be challenged it's like crossing the abyss in that shamanic journey you know and steiner talks about this you need the fire for the truth you you, you need to, to to have the intent and the will to know uh jung talks about this on so his path of individuation and when you look through at his images you can see how he was incredibly tested even for his assumptions for his thinking snakes are evil even for, for thinking about the theory of opposites was necessary for his theory of duality so you, you've got all these hurdles to pass and that's a hard journey to go on and it, not everyone's going to go on that which is where the separation begins and, and um, 
And yet when you come together in these groups and it works, you have this amazing flow uh, where the world is conspiring to help you. And that's, that's just an amazing sort of thing where, where uh, intuition builds, empathy builds, uh, telepathy builds. And before you know it, you're, you're uh, part of this great cosmic grand design. You then kind of realize you're just a pawn in the system and, 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 and basically you're not as, not as important as you think you might have been. Uh, but then you're left with this, this revelation that in order to do what you must be doing, you must be helping other people. And that is how a question and, and that that's when you move from the mind centeredness to the heart centeredness and learn how to create heart resonance. Fortunately, there are people who are who are already teaching things like this, but it's about practice and getting better at that and putting people on the right sites. And then and the most amazing thing is because this vibration here that we know is stable. It's like a very fundamental. You should know this chain from music. The, the, the fundamental frequency has such a power it'll have harmonics, it does have harmonics all above it. And when you, when you create a, a similar sound, either through chanting or through using Tibetan bowls, which is a perfect harmonic of this underlying basic frequency, you have this, what the tempers called the infinite spiral of the fifth. So you've got this perfect resonance. And when you get that, you just, everything starts shaking. Every vibration in your body starts shaking. It's just about anything you can think just happens. It's just magic. And then, and that, breaks down perceptual barriers and just takes you to the nearer nearest sort of level of cosmic truth that there is and um you get some pretty pretty crazy experiences and and um yeah we're just learning still it's a, it's a heck of a journey but to just get get to these nodes get to groups of people you don't have to do organization either it just happens right That's i was gonna I, I was gonna before you mentioned shane i was gonna bring up shane because he's got unbiased and on the fence and you mentioned about how all these groups from all these different viewpoints come together. That's why Shane has unbiased and on the fence. It's all about that. Ooh, and, yeah. and Shane, um, he's got this, such a high vibe um, center and he's in his presentations for IMEC and so forth. He talks about the heart centeredness. I, to me, he is the heart of IMEC and I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got this visual uh, when you so were can talking. Give you one, oh, one yeah, thought, thing. This, 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 can you imagine trying to play, music with an instrument that's continually out of tune and it's always having to be retuned right and, and the time that takes and now come to an instrument where the tuning is always the same it's always consistent and you can go and pick it up and immediately you know where you are each time that's where we're heading with the harmony times it'll that's be beautiful. so much easier for you to connect with it regularly again and again and again Right. And I think that's one thing that we look at when, you know, you're talking about all these groups came together and their place was a little bit different. It's almost like the colors of the rainbow uh, on your screen. You know, you have all these colors that are created. And if you're missing a big section of them, you're going to be missing uh, part of the experience of whatever the image is supposed to look like. So I love the fact that it, it really takes the unifying of the diversity to to create the full picture so it's like we're coming together in our uniqueness you know what i mean and it's like uh and we're celebrating the diversity because everyone's bringing something to help bring the whole picture into view you and, know, and so shane what you were what you were talking earlier about art and, and and tapping into the subconscious by looking at art we've discovered the, the most amazing thing we, i run these discussion groups to, which, which will be um, made public later for everyone to be able to do but we're doing through a testing phase but we're looking at things like jung's red book images we're we're, we're uh, tapping into the subconscious by going into aware state to see what insights come through and then what we do is we share insights that come through to us whilst other people are in their aware states and they then get insights on the insights they hear now, this is the key thing is that when you've got the perfect group where everyone is different you don't just get a two-dimensional flat view from the subconscious you get this three-dimensional perspective where you're getting things which you would never get coming through because you're not the same type of person and you're suddenly finding actually now this person who i would normally wouldn't sit and drink with you know is 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 bringing me a perspective that i cannot believe ever and, and then you begin to value what you do because others suddenly realize 
you're doing something they can't do. And it's overcoming this massive hurdle about us not getting on and we're recognizing that these these barriers have been falsely imprisoning us for, for years. <laughs> and, and, and just only like... when we start getting into our aware states and seeing the potential that others can give that we get this three-dimensional picture. And that's when groups start really beginning to take off. And we haven't even started talking about them meditating yet. But so that, that there's there's some tremendously positive times ahead. And, and we don't have to do too much. Just gather to these sacred sites and let, let the energies teach us and let get get our individual consciousness so I get out of the way and, and uh, tune in and, and see I rabbit on a lot, don't I? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it is almost like that. it's like we're allowing the universe to tune us. And as the more we move into that heart space, and I wanted to ask you, um, because, you know, I have to wonder how much is individual, how much is a global thing, because I've noticed as I've moved more into the heart space, how much more connected with everything and information in general and uh, things that even normally worry me uh, would have normally worried me. I can tap into a deeper knowledge and see a bigger, deeper picture of why maybe something that could seem disturbing is happening on a, on a broader sense and how it can be triggering and a catalyst to greater things. But it might not look like that you know, from the, the individual's perspective. So my question is with these lines, you said they doubled in 2017. What have they done since then? And is the area between the lines also at a higher base level? Uh, because it seems like, you know, if like in my area, I don't think I'm on a node or a line or anything. Um, I don't know, but it seems like just globally it's increased for me. I mean, but I don't know if it's the heart connection I was just telling you about that makes me more in tune to what's coming in or if the baseline is increasing for everyone without getting well, to one of these zones? The, the the lines are the high pressure zones, but you don't have to be on them to be in the field. So you'll mm -hmm. certainly feel the field. But but uh, the sixth emperor dragon that arrived, the last one arrived actually ran through the states. It, it comes in through uh, California, exits around Norfolk, North, uh, Virginia. Uh, it runs through some incredible sites across America. And, and you ask a question about what's in between the lines. Well, I have a, a lovely friend who I met by complete synchronicity on the top of Silbury Hill back in 1999, a Native American Indian chap called David Alexander English, who, who lives in, uh, well, used to be in Venice Beach, but he now lives in, uh, in and around uh, California. But he, he's been uh, meditating on some very powerful nodes that on the lines that run just south of Monterey and, and, and another place just down there. Um, and he's now witnessing these these lines, uh, which are you know quite a few kilometers apart. They're widening. And, and that corridor that crosses the states, which is, is called now the sacred corridor, is enclosing. And that sacred space in the middle is becoming. Uh, and there's another lady that, that I'm in communication with who lives actually in, in the Virginia area, Floyd, that place called Floyd. And she's now experiencing these lines coming in and she's holding that space there. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's some exciting times and what we're learning about. But the, the widening of the emperor, sixth emperor dragon is happening independently of everything else. It's almost like that's the one that's, that, that is being driven by the galactic center source. I, I feel like that, that that emperor line you mentioned that goes through the United States, I, I felt that if it comes in, I think it feels like it comes, I've been feeling it for decades, actually. So I think some of us can feel them before they come in. I'm, I'm just, I'm so emotional. Sorry. Well, you're, but, you're, you're, you're feeling things outside of the realms of time. So yes. Oh, course. yes, we're, that's we're, what it we're is. We're living in, in our own linear concept of time in this world. Yes. Oh, I'm very keenly aware of that. When you said Virginia, I just get goosebumps. Like I've known that that's where it comes out on the East Coast. And then it would feel like around Monterey area, you know, a little south of that for where it comes on the West Coast. I don't know. Yeah, I have, yeah. But, but we can't. The, so they're they're palpable. Some of us can feel these, and I just I'm validating what you're saying. I'm saying yes, 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 and I loved what you said about the. Oh my gosh, everything you're saying is that's just the emperor dragons there. The, the type four lines. I've been I've been mapping. I've been spent three and a half years mapping these major lines in the states. Uh, I, I do things like sacred site searches for people, and, and and gradually I'm building up the picture of where these lines intersect, and I'm coming across just incredible places. And, and, and the other weird thing is I might be tracking two lines heading towards each other. I'm thinking, I wonder where they're going to intersect. And I get an email from somebody saying, I live in such and such a place. You've got to know about this place. And suddenly I'm introduced to this sacred site that the lines are heading towards. I'm thinking, oh, this is weird, you know. And the next thing you get taken down uh, and you hear these, these incredible stories. There's one lady in Texas. She tells me, she says, so I was up on, the, on, on going up towards the knob with my husband, you know, uh, some time ago. And suddenly I saw uh, herds of uh, buffalo 
on the plain below and and these lines of, of uh, uh, Native American Indians on horseback looking at them and the next thing and I'm suddenly back to, next to my husband and he's saying to me he's a bit of a scientist he's saying what, 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 what was going on you were you were disappearing in front of my eyes all I could see was your hand I had to pull you back <laughs> so it's like you know this is a powerful node that she'd come on and she'd entered into that state where she physically started disappearing wow. and he had to pull her back there is so much more we don't know I mean, you're reminded of the Mayans, right? Didn't yes. the Mayans sort of phase out or something? Well, the the Queros in in in, uh, in in Peru talk about the gateways to the gods and the gateways to the ancestors opening and closing. We think that's a connection to when these cosmic energies come through or not, because when they don't come through, you don't have the nodes, you can't go anywhere. So they they definitely knew that when the portals were open the gods would come through the giants would come through and that's another story you know we, we're going to be introduced they talk about the veils of, of humanity being lifted and, and uh we're being refinding ourselves the great tarape patcher refining who we really are actually finding our ancestors again alive and communicating with them and, and even the, the greats like goethe who wrote this amazing uh, fairy tale called The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily, which is more on my, on my book, if you want to listen to that, on, on my website. But but he talks about the, the bridge between the land of the senses and the land of spirit and the time when the bridge, the permanent bridge, will be built between them. And he links it by using the phrase, the times at hand with regards to revelations in the Bible. And that talking about, again, the new Jerusalem being built uh, and again, you want you want to read the, the old Vulgarity Bible, your Bible of the of Revelations. When you start realizing they're mentioning a tree of life in the Bible across the river, you know, there's there's just so much. And even in Jung's Red Book pictures, there's just so much geobiology of nodes and snakes. I'm thinking, I can't believe this. He's, he's going on an incubatory journey, and no one's picked this up. It, it, all the messages are in there. We're being told all over the place, but the biggest suppression in in this whole world for 2000 of years is is about to stop us recognizing this cyclic moment so that we don't take advantage of our evolution of humanity and we may we may think there's people on the other side trying to stop us but the weird thing is it's they're playing devil's advocate they're actually helping us by taking by by being able for us to, to experience intense negativity it's the only way we'll ever get to experience intense positivity and if i leave you with one more thought you know, so, so they're actually helping us to get to this evolution. One more thought, which which uh, is is reassuring in in some ways. And I I used to be, be failing this earlier. I used to think I've got to work more, I've got to do more, I've got to do more. We have been taken on this journey so slowly, so subtly. It's been done at a pace that we can cope with. Exactly. We can be patient. This is beautiful. I just love it. And I I know we don't want to keep you too late. I realize it's late where you are. Thank you for joining us. But we do have a little quiz that we'd like to take you through. This is our Mandela effect. And um, so it's, it's there, like Shane said before we started, there's no wrong answer. Um, and maybe you could. Yeah, and the audience can participate too. Yes, yeah, this, is, this is a lot of fun for all of us. So you can explain how this works, Shane. Um, okay, so we will just uh, ask what you remember. And along with the audience, uh, the chat, you guys can chime in of what you remember. And then we'll see what this current reality says and if it agrees with uh, how you remembered it. So with this first one here, um, this ancient Roman thumb signal means, uh, looks like a thumbs down. Yeah, thumbs down. So we give, this is your chance, Rory, to just say anything that comes to your mind. And if no you don't know, you can. I think I know what this one means. It, it means that the person's fought well, put your weapons down, he can live. Okay. That's I'm not, not sure about this answer either. So, so yeah, we'll we'll see and we'll that see is, what the, is, yeah, let's see the next slide. And everyone, oh, wait, maybe after everyone gets a chance to put in the chat. I'm not watching the YouTube. Yeah, channel. there is a little bit of a delay. So put your answers in the chat and we'll see it. And let's go to the next slide and see if uh, at the Colosseum the emperor decided the fate of defeated gladiators. However, despite it being a central part of the way, gladiator gladiatorial fights have been depicted in art and film. There's no evidence to suggest the thumbs down signal was given to condemn a man to death. Some historians believe the thumbs up was a signal for death. Wow. So it's opposite. And it actually goes along with how you remember it happening there. I didn't know either way, but yeah, I would have thought from my upbringing and, and my experience that the thumbs down would be bad, you know, just kind of like a, 
the thumbs up means put the dagger up your throat. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, we want to thank uh, Sharon Cochran for the super sticker. Thank you so much. And okay, uh, okay. So Bob thought it was for the death. All right, let's move on to the next one here in our quiz. I would have gotten that last one wrong. Yeah, I put these together so I know the answers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can see what I would have thought. Yeah. Well, this one here, you want to fill in the blank with what is uh, the way you remember it, and this is the blank of Dorian Gray, and we have two choices here: a portrait or the picture. How do you remember that, Rory? And you guys in the chat can type in what you remember. The blank of Dorian Gray. Uh, I think it's picture. The picture. Okay. And you guys can type in. Okay, we have one portrait so far. Thank you, Joe. Let's see what this one is. Heather, producer Heather, behind the scenes. Let's go to the next slide. Let's see. It's the picture of Dorian Gray. Just like, uh, just like Rory remembers it. And... Uh, a lot of people remember the portrait. Okay, so it was written by Oscar Wilde and published. Oh, go ahead, uh, Cynthia. It would have been portrait. And this was weird for me, just because I remember I used to see it. There, it was. It's weird that that one changed for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a strange one. So uh, let's see. This was Wilde's only novel, which was a subject of controversy and criticism at the time. It was published, but has come to be recognized as a classic of Gothic literature. What gift might this change from portrait to picture represent for you, if it indeed is a change? It didn't change for Rory, but for me it did. Um, I think that's interesting, you know, because when you think portrait, then that's a that's something that would be subjective, and picture seems like a photograph. But um, that's it, true, yeah. I don't know what else. But if it didn't change, then there's no symbolic meaning necessarily. It, it is sort of a revelation of truth, because portrait sounds more like a you know subjective, right? But I actually like, like portraits. Something. Yeah, portrait to me seems warmer. It seems like when an artist does yeah. a portrait, then they can capture something that that you see when you see them, but it mm -hmm. may not be caught ever by a camera. Yeah, there's more intimacy, I think, in the portrait than the picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's see what we got here. Number three. Who invented the Pythagorean theorem? You know, like who's buried in Grant's tomb. Right. <laughs> and we'll see uh, if anybody in the chat has an idea of who invented the Pythagorean theorem. And what would your answer be? Or what's your experience, Rory? I think it was an Indian uh, gentleman about 300 years before him. And I can't remember his name, uh, but he, he'd come up with it before. Um, I, I'll try to remember that. I'm trying to stretch my memory for it. Yeah, that sounds familiar to me as well. Uh, something beginning with S or something. Yeah, Pythagoras. Let's. Okay, a lot of people in the chat think it's Pythagoras. I think I'd heard about this one before. Well, let's look at the next slide. Thank you, Heather. The Babylonians invented uh -huh. the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, I didn't remember where it was, but I thought he sort of popularized it more than uh, uh, so. A thousand years before the Greeks, a thirty-seven hundred year old clay tablet has revealed that the ancient Babylonians understood the Pythagorean theorem more than 1,000 years before the birth of the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who is widely associated with the idea. So yeah, that was uh, one that I think I'd heard before. Is it interesting? I didn't okay. know. Interesting. Oh, yeah. sorry. It fooled a lot of people. It's like people don't remember. Right. <laughs> That's the thing with naming it after you can sort of get that false, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Let's move on to question number four. Did Braveheart wear a kilt? Is the question. <laughs> what do you guys remember in the chat? I don't know this one particularly, but uh, do you remember uh, Braveheart wearing a kilt or not, Rory? I'm not sure there was a character called Braveheart. There was a guy called William Wallace, and he would have wore played. Okay. Okay, we're getting yes, no idea. I'm in the no idea pile. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to, we were trying to pick some that would be possibly um, applicable to people living in the UK. That's right. Sometimes there's different ones. Oh, somebody feels like it's another trick question. Yes, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no quick, no, no trick questions here. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please, Heather. 
most likely no. William Wallace, who yeah, you um, uh, yeah. said that was who it was, uh, was famously placed, played by Mel Gibson in Braveheart. Wallace lived in the late 1200s and was victorious over the English in 1297 at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. The kilt was adopted later as the Scottish National Battle Garment from the 16th century onwards when it became such a prominent symbol that it was made illegal by the English in 1746. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know this history. It was really, yeah, I remember Braveheart. I remember Mel Gibson. So I would have had the wrong impression that it was, yeah, that, yeah he would have worn so, it. So it came around, I guess, at a later time. So. You have to be Scottish for that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know right. what, you know, your history. Yep. Let's move on to the next slide here. Number five. Okay. This is the song that, uh, let's see. Okay. We're missing two words. So, this is the song that blank, 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 or, you know, I, I sorry, I did it for syllables. I kind of gave away. <laughs> yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Do you know what lyrics are missing there? That's Sherry Lewis. Fill in the blank, you guys, Lamb in the chat. Chop. And we'll see if Rory is familiar with this. Yeah, Lamb Chop. Yeah, Sherry Lewis. Um, Ventriloquist. This is a song that goes, don't know. Lost me on that one. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh. Okay, we got Never Ends. That's what I would have said. This is the Never song Ends. This is the song that never ends. Goes on and on, my friend. And we have uh, Doesn't. Song that doesn't end, I guess. Let's go to the next slide and see what the answer is to this one, Heather. Thank you. This is a song that never ends. Is this is a song that doesn't end? What? This is one of those. Like so the, it's, yeah, it's the, tricked. But I remember them singing. This is the song that never ends. So it's weird that now the lyrics are okay. Old. So the title didn't change, but the lyrics did. It's That's another one of those. Okay, I had another one like that for me. Was uh, we won't get fooled again by the Who or I, I can't remember who it was. Yeah. But it was a really old song, and it's still titled. We won't get fooled again, but now he says we don't get fooled again, or vice versa. I kind of mix them up now. I don't know which way it is, but it's confusing. But I remember, <laughs> I remember they sang it was the song that never ends. It's, yeah, that's wild. Okay, how many do we have in here? Let's go to the next slide here. Um, we're moving on to number six of eight, so just a few more. Number six is the Rock of Gibraltar, uh, an island. Is the question. I don't know this one, but let's see. What what do you remember, Rory? And you guys can chime in in the chat. No, you is can it drive island? across it to Spain. Okay, so it is not an island, according to Rory. What do you guys think in the chat? We got international viewers. Sally says no. I don't know about this one particularly. Uh, Joe says yes, an island. So let's go to the next slide and see what this is here. The Rock of Gibraltar is part of Spain on the Iberian Peninsula. So it's it's on a peninsula, but it's not an island. I know. I, I did uh, hear from someone who uh, was professionally like a cartologist or something, and he he had this Mandela effect, which was super freaky for him because he knew for sure that it used to be an island. He knew for sure that was like this is what I what I did. And then <laughs> Sally him, lives in Spain too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sometimes, if you live somewhere, like if you're in South Africa, then Mandela didn't die for you. That kind of thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes if you're close to things, they don't change. But in this case, yeah. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Here's a good one. Okay. Which are the real salt and vinegar Walker's crisps? Uh, we got, um, does, does either one of these look familiar to you, Rory? The green or the blue? It probably blues my age, but that's what it remembers. I think probably the sort of thing is a later version. I don't know. Right. Okay. And you guys can chime in in the chat, especially if you're from the UK area. Let's see. Sally says blue. Joe says green. Let's see what it actually is. Let's go to the next slide. The green bags of Walker's crisps have always been salt and vinegar, not cheese and onion. How interesting is that? Wow. Oh, there you go. There we go. Mark says blue. Yeah, so Rory's noticed a couple of differences so far. 
That's good. All right. I think we got one more here. Let's go to the next slide. So where are the kidneys located? We got them down low or up higher under the rib cage. So I guess really, do you think they're protected by the rib cage or not? Uh, judging by these two, one's higher, yeah, one's lower. For me, they're on the right, they're higher up. They're higher up, okay, and see what you guys, Sally, are they up or down? Let's see, um, I'm from the UK as well, Natalie says. So what do you guys remember with the, okay, Sally says in the rib cage. So higher up, that's on the right. Let's go to the next slide and see where they're located. Kidneys are now situated higher in the body than many recall, no longer anywhere near where a kidney punch might be delivered. That's yes, interesting. We got the residue of the kidney punch where, you know, not to, like I did martial arts, not Aikido, but I was doing cook school one. So a lot of martial artists would know um, not to do a strike in a certain body area. And that would, that's still recognized. Don't hit the lower back, but the kidneys aren't there anymore. So calling it a kidney punch, it doesn't make sense anymore but we still call it that. So it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is strange the way stuff seems to survive like that. You get um, residual evidence of things being a different way. And I think another one was, uh, do you remember the uh, Rodin's thinker statue? Uh, Rory, do you remember how his uh, hand was positioned in your memory? I think it was like this. So he's, uh, he's on his fist and the fist was towards him. Okay, so for me, I've, I've, I've like uh, experienced three versions of this, right? Like growing up, I had one of these statues and the fist was to the forehead, which there's a, 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 a workout muscle man pose called the thinker, you know, where he's got his hand like to his forehead or whatever. That's named, that's kind of what came to, to mind there. But uh, then uh, when I first found out about it, he had his hand under the chin, like, like you were just showing. And then when I went to show somebody, I don't know, a few months later, it, the fist had moved up and he was like sucking on his knuckles. And that was, well, unless it's changed since I last looked, that's the current way. Same way with the Mona Lisa, three different versions, you know, like she, her smile, it was kind of an enigmatic look on her face. And then her smile kind of increased just a little bit. And then she got this hair net and then, and now she's got this, uh, you know, like a, a little bump on her inside of her bridge of her nose that people didn't notice. So a lot of these things, things seem to shift over time. But yeah, he's uh, it's shifted once since you last looked at it, apparently, and he's now sucking on his knuckles um, and his, you know, uh, fist isn't quite closed anymore either. So that's a pretty interesting one. Yeah. Do we have another slide after this one? Yeah, we, we do. We got, um, I think the next one might be, let's thank our current and new Patreon sponsors. I can try to read through these. J.D. Peterson, James, S.E. Badillo. Aurora Grace H, Yulia, Vicki Hatters, Stephanie Clay, Stefania Man Manis' daughter, Mel, Colleen Learley, Gil R, Julia Pudreka, Jody, Suzanne Elizabeth, Jason Ram, Ariana Elise, or Ice, uh, Christina, Josiah, uh oh, Bor Borussius, Piper, um, boy, I'm sorry about these names, Trotter. <laughs> Paul Ellis, Michelle Walker, and then we've got Bo Kim, Lee Birch, and Holly. Thank you to everybody. We really appreciate your support. And again, we are a, a nonprofit organization, and your donations are tax deductible. Okay, and then I think we got the next slide. This would be, oh, wait, where's our Q&A slide? I'll mention this. We want to do Q&A, uh, but I'll, as long as we're here. But yes, we are next month's episode save the date wednesday july 27th and there we go time for questions so this is the opportunity for everybody if you've got a question based on this presentation today for rory while he's here with us please put it in the chat obviously if you're watching this this video later then it's, you can put your questions in the comments maybe rory might stop by who knows um, but now you've got him for sure okay here we go question for rory this is from sally Jupa, do you plan to expand your exploration of lines across southern Spain, maybe east-west from the Murcia area, as I live in what seems in Costa Blanca north, looking to be in line with those? Uh, yeah, I did a road trip uh, two, two years ago with my wife. Uh, no, it's probably three, 
four years ago now, we, we, we followed the lines uh, uh, from uh, Mercia down to um, one just runs to the north of uh, Cadiz and the other one's just to the south of Cadiz. But it goes through some amazing old sites, uh, Antiquera, um, um, Guadix, where there's some prehistoric uh, uh, megaliths. Uh, and I also um, tracked them uh, to the Mediterranean coast, just north of uh, Torrevecchia. So yes, I have done that. And um, at some point, I might even videoed some of it. We might put put something together. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, when just before I was doing that trip, uh, a chap that contacted me from from um, from Granada, he said, "Can you explain why I've got all these sacred sites in a line across here?" I was able to say, ah, what's well, funny that, but, uh, you know, they, they follow these energy lines. And, and and several of them were things called hypergeums. There's a, there's a hypergeum near uh, Dona Blanca, near Cadiz. And it's quite clear this was a place which was hollowed out in an area which was used as a sound chamber for healing, a bit like the hypergeum in, in Malta. But, um, yes, so, so we have looked at them and we've got a fairly accurate position of where they are on that. And then the two other ones go up north. Uh, through Mercia to um, crossing the Pyrenees and into France and then across uh, Germany, Netherlands into um, to Denmark. And I've, I've tracked them towards uh, uh, Sweden. Um, there's some Swedish Swedish dowsers now. They're going to be looking into following them from there. So, yeah. I hope that answers the question. Well, that's really cool. Uh, uh, I, I was wondering, can't... Yeah, do, do you I'm often... Sorry. So I can't remember where Costa Blanca North is offhand, so I can't <laughs> answer that. Completely. That's a tough one. But you actually do, or you have gone to lots of these places, like when you talk about these lines in America or these emperor lines, are you personally visiting most of them or sometimes I'm do not you? every one of them in America, but um, I have been to one amazing line, uh, which uh, started with a site search for, for looking for a sacred site for a lady in Reykjavik. And I came across a, a, an old Viking temple there. Uh, and that line was sitting on an alignment that uh, runs across down through Canada through an amazingly sacred place in, in, to the Crow Nation in, in southern Montana in the Prior Mountains. And it runs down through Prior Gap. And I didn't know where it was heading until I eventually found it going to California. And, and it happened to be exactly on a node that I'd visited like uh, two year, two and a half years ago, just before lockdown, I was invited to uh, to, to do some training for a, a lovely couple out in uh, Carlsbad, and I was looking for for places to do that, and it ran through that node, and that 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 gave me that connection to that line, and and it runs through all some amazing, powerful places, you know, not just in America, but when it comes down through Europe, it goes through uh, um, a sun temple, a German sun temple near Hanover. It goes down through uh, an island in Greece called uh, Patmos, which was where St. John the theologian actually had a vision, uh, which led to him writing the whole book of Revelations in the Bible. And that vision was of an angel in a cave. And that's where that node was on that, and that same line. It then runs through the pyramids in Giza, all the way down to a place in, in Eritrea called the Deborah Bitson Monastery up at 12,000 feet, where there's a sort of monastery that's been going for hundreds of years. And that is sitting on uh, an emperor dragon line that crosses Africa. So I, I can't get to them all, but I have been to sites. So it runs through the Orkneys and Scarabray and the, the, the Ness of Brodka and Ring of Brodka, and I've been there. So yes, I'm, I'm trying to get to as many of the key ones as I can, but the, the upshot of doing a lot of dowsing is you can do remote dowsing. And then if you look for synchronicity and feedback, you can find uh, that your remote dowsing is, is correct. For, for, for instance, you can, there's, there's a, a just quick example. I, I found a node in, 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 of these lines heading in the, in the middle of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And it's just like you know, a mountain range. And you think, well, wh where's the node there? And you scroll in gradually and you do that and you check again and you scroll in and you, you get bigger and bigger. And first, finally, you find this little oasis. And you know, it's in the oasis. And you scroll in and you finally get to the small scale. It's not in the oasis. It's just off of the side of the oasis. And when you scroll into that, you see there's an old fort there with a tiny Muslim shrine. And you think, how could that happen, you know? And, and, you, and you, you find these incredible things at the end of a hunt, which you could never know to begin with. I was wondering if you've noticed any kind of feedback back and forth, because I've noticed when I've done, um, like, Institute of Noetic Sciences, it's right here in California. and 
they did an experiment. Um, Dean Radin, their chief scientist, had called in some Buddhist monks, uh, Tibetan monks, and they had done meditation. And I could feel the difference because I'd been to that the room where they'd meditated before and after. So clearly, humans have the, the ability to charge, energetically charge and activate a location. But then there's also the energy of the field. So there's a back and forth. And I, I'd love you to talk about that a little bit. Well, it's how we repair lines. How we have to move them to repair nodes. And so you understand how you how you connect with the lines, how you move them, and there's several ways of moving them, but it's also an understanding how they're disrepaired through negative emotions. So you find that nodes are, have, have lost key lines and they lose their power because they don't have the symmetry. So yes, we have, a, 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 if you look at sacredness of a site, it's a function not just of location, but of human interaction there too. So you, you, you can have a, one of the most powerful sites in the world, but if nobody goes there, it's not doing as much as what a smaller, a smaller a node could do when you have a lot of regular people meditating on it. That's such a beautiful answer. Thank you. It, it fills my heart with, with hope and love. And I, it seems like it's bigger than it seems. It seems like it directly addresses some of the, that big issue about the three protections um, for, you know, against this magnetic mm -hmm. stress go through the sun, the earth, and then, oh, you look like you got something, Shane. Yeah, well, we can make a difference. Yeah, I got, a, I got another question. This one's from Natalie. Could you tell us more about what happens on Earth after December 24th when the lines harmonize? Yeah, we start learning faster. <laughs> uh, in, in, in all honesty, the we, we've got 20 to 30 years to, to come up with a solution for future problems. But we'll do that. The energies will guide us and teach us. So we don't have to worry that far ahead. That's awesome. And, and we're on cosmic scale, right? So, I mean, even now we're already in this leading up to this 2024 event because it's so gradual, right? I mean, it's already happening. It's just sort of that's the culmination of it, I guess. And if you look at what, you know, what uh, we'll enter the sixth, sixth epoch probably, which means there will be greater empathy, greater telepathy, a common consciousness will fall upon us and, and uh, we'll learn to be more heart centered in order to help people. So that, that's that's the future. That's beautiful. This question comes from Joe, uh, who asks, is this, in fact, another reset? Is this how it's done? A reset seems something which is very hard and fast and fixed, and the universe doesn't seem to work like that. There's gradual changes. It's dynamic, but it's not fast. It's sort of, it gradually takes you through, so you have time to, to go with it. Mm -hmm. So for, 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 for me, yeah, yeah, you're probably looking at what... What's, what's happening right now in the world is in the Western world, at least, is they're looking to collapse society financially so they can bring in their own uh, new models, which are centralized. I suspect highly that they're behind schedule. It's not going their way. And we won't get the reset, but we're going to get a spiritual revolution. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. I got a question from Adam Ant, and he says, are there any of these sacred sites in Northern California? Probably Mount Shasta, maybe. Um, I know you mentioned California, but uh, what could you tell us about the ley lines in California, or energy lines? Yeah, Shasta's a node. Uh, I'm just trying to think of a, there's a place called Carvers. There's a quite a strong node in the mountains and in the Carvers area. Um, just outside San Francisco, there's a place called Mount Diablo. There's a strong node there. Um, it, it, the, the slight difficulty with some of these nodes is that the well-known places are not as accessible as the ones which you can find in parks. Um, the, the idea is to find the lines and, and not just the inaccessible places where people can't get here easily. For instance, one of the most powerful places in uh, in, in uh, Colorado, in, in America, is on the Emperor Dragon, which is, uh, runs through a Blanca Peak. But you can't keep going up there. It's a bit of a climb. <laughs> so you have to find places where people can gather. And, and that, that sometimes, actually, the strange thing is that you, it, it, you do find them going through all sorts of different churches, which is nice. That's yeah. great, because that's a perfect segue into my next question from uh, Sharon Cochran, who asked, what are the Emperor Dragons? Can you go in a little bit more of this new energetic line that sort of appeared well the, the the inner core which acts as a transducer needs source energy to reach it before it can be conduced to project a, a, a linear concentration of energy 
on the surface of the earth, which which we we're, we're calling emperor dragons, but it's like a field of energy. But what what makes them different is that this source energy is galactic, and the fact that it's galactic means the cosmic energy has got to travel for for miles and miles through space, but it can be stopped easily by interstellar magnetic fields or Earth's magnetic fields. So so. There are times when these emperor dragons in the past will have appeared and then disappeared and then appeared and disappeared, depending on whether the source energy can get through. But what, what happens is that it produces this vibration, this resonance, which uh, in, in particular the galactic, uh, the, the center of our galaxy is so overpowering, it produces this two, three hundred year long period of harmony of, of, of where all the energies are now the same frequency. And, and it's it looks like it happens every 12,000 years and it's a time which is connected to the cycles of changing consciousness. Wonderful. It seems like a pretty cool um, plan for, for, by the creator. To, 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 is it an environment for us to learn, develop and grow? Yeah, it really does seem like it shows intelligent and creative design. There's yeah, yeah. a deep wisdom in that consciousness. I I've got a question from Sally, which is a great question, because I was actually going to ask this myself before she did. And uh, she says, will you produce a whole world map of these lines so we can explore? No. No? <laughs> or is it constantly changing? or? The aim is not to produce information for people. It's to get information to about local sites to local people. I see. Beautiful. I mean, the, 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 to produce it, well, I mean, there's a world map of the Emperor Dragons. There, that's out there. You can see that. But I'm talking about uh, anything useful. You need to have very small scale, and that's far too many hours work to go small scale. But what, what I do is I find ways of getting that information to local people, and that's what the Sacred Network's about. And you also provide training, too, right? Like, you'll help teach people how to do this, right? So no, they can no, work the, the, I, I mean, I can teach people to DAOs, but I can't teach people what to do at the sites. That's what the, the energies do. The energy, the, 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 the teacher, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and according to the Gnostic Gospels, was known as the teacher and the instructor. And, and the serpent wind itself around the tree of knowledge, which is the axis mundi. This is the, this is the root between the worlds, the tree of life. That is the teacher. So the energy lines are the teacher, that the energy centers are the distant schools. So that, that's what you do that. But, but all I can do is get people to the schools. They have to teach themselves. And, and, and one of the biggest problems we have is losing our individual consciousness and losing our ego. And one of the big problems with that is having a curiosity. And when you move from focus to conscious, a focus state, a, con a conscious focus state, you need to get to an aware subconscious state. And if you bring any kind of curiosity with you, except for the fire to know the truth, you're, you're, you're not going to get the information. So being curious to want to know where all the lines in the world are is not going to help. Well, what about uh, if somebody just wants to organize something in their own area or just go meditate somewhere like that? Where, like in my area, what would you suggest I do if I wanted to find the closest place I can drive to? And well, maybe so spend hopefully it? when the sacred network is up, you can just go onto the map and you can see that site and see if anyone's running anything there or if you want to run something there. Okay. So it'll be, it'll, it'll be filled with local modes. Um, but whereabouts is your area, Shane? I live in uh, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I've not got something from my mind for you for that. So I'll have to. Ah, have okay. to, to look at it. I mean, it's it's a big exercise. I've not mapped all the states yet, but it may well be a line heading that way. I think just having Shane there creates positive. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been super great. This is no. A little bit late. Okay, so. at last question, or maybe let's yeah. wrap it up. Right. Yeah, it looks like a, let's see. Choose one, best one. Uh, I think we got them all. If I miss one, you can pop it up there for me, Heather. I don't see any questions. Uh, oh, there we go. Great question. And this is one you'll probably know. Is there one of the sacred sites near or in London in the UK? Well, there are no emperor dragons that run through the UK, but there are uh, type four energy lines. Uh, the nearest strong one is probably at Royston, just uh, to the north of London. But there are smaller sites in London um, that I'm aware of. There's one in Bishop's Park uh, Palace near Putney. There's uh, there's, there's a uh, one in Wanstead Flats. So I'm, I'm, there are more, but we're, we're, we're finding them slowly. They'll be on. They'll be on the map soon. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marie. Yeah. 
I realize it's late there and we really appreciate you sharing your wisdom, your enthusiasm, your inspiration, your dedication, and just um, firing people up. Cause I think that's the most important thing. You're getting people, you certainly inspire me. So thank you from- Well, thank from you both very much. Thank you. thank you. And yeah, so I think we can go ahead and next slide. We're gonna roll, I think, is there anything else? More slides? I think we're done So roll. So we'll see you guys next month. It'll be July yeah. like 27th and looking yeah. forward to and be sure to check out Rory's links in the description yes. box below. Yes. To and share, more like, share this video, um, sign up for our newsletter. And we'll, till next time, we love you very much. And together we go, together we grow. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Love you.